their part in Jakarta, where the recovery effort and investigation is centered. And those survivors have been found among the 62 people on board. Well, for more, we have Captain Gemma Guayardi joining us live from Jakarta this morning. He's an FAA flight instructor as well as a Citation V jet Captain, so again, I thank you very much for joining us this morning. You know, reports are saying that it was four minutes after taking off that the plane lost more than 10,000 feet in altitude in less than 60 seconds. What does the data tell you about what could have happened to the plane, and could the crash have been avoided? Okay, good morning. Um, uh, first of all, I'm sending our deepest condolences for this. May God bless all the families. And uh, please be aware that what we will discuss is not a conclusion and just an awareness for early analysis according to secondary data that we're using the ADSB technology. The conclusion will only be made um, by the NTSC uh, with the primary data later from the flight data recorder that we believe that we already discovered it. However, since um, they will take so much time by following the certain procedures on the Annex 13 or CASR or uh, FAR 8, uh, A30, that's for the accidents. We believe the public still has a right to get a better picture about what happened and this content will minimize a wild speculation out there we do our best to give public ideas for what is likely to happen so basically accident happens not just for one reason so if people asking why this happened the, the reason is this is like a chain like a chain of causes aligned together at the perfect time perfect place to create a catastrophic accident just like a swiss cheese model uh, we only know for sure the cause of this uh, this accident with the complete data uh, by using the flight data recorder but there are two types of accidents the number one is the safe bit, the control of flight the terrain and loss of aircraft control and this accident I believe this is not a controlled flight into terrain because the, the airplane is not flying to the mountain area, but the loss of aircraft control is likely uh, become the category of this accident. And based on the data, we completely see when the, when the airplane departs from Jakarta and following the standard instrument departure, uh, we believe it is Abasa to departure. Is um, after airborne heading to the west, and the airplane took uh, took off to the right after 1,000 feet, and at some point we call that RNAV departure uh, point Ajuna. The airplane should turn to the right for heading 081, but instead uh, maybe the airplane is requested for um, avoiding the weather. Then the Sriwijaya keep flying to the north. Then after that, <clears throat> the plane reached the 10,900 feet according to the ADSB. But in the 0740 GMT, suddenly something happened. Um, the plane dived down for minus 4,500 feet per minute and turning to the left. And finally following by minus 27,000 feet per minute, 30,000 feet per minute. And yeah, it's just like that. At some point of, um, at the height of um, 5,400 something, then suddenly it showing the positive rate of climb about 20,000 feet per minute going up this really weird situation um, and not for more than a few seconds is uh, the final catastrophe happened the, the plane crashed to the water so is everything happened just like less than one minute Hi, Gemma. You know, this raises an important issue because I mean notwithstanding the age of the aircraft and I want to talk about that too because According to the data, that uh, Boeing 737 is almost 27 years old and was operated by Continental and United. We'll put that aside for now because it's a much earlier edition of the 737 yeah. family of jets. I want to raise the issue of communications between the pilot, the co-pilot, and also the, cop, uh, the control, uh, the, uh, air, the traffic and tower. Because when you look at the transcripts of Lion Air, there seemed to be a lot of confusion with the co-pilot, the pilot, and also air traffic control because they also couldn't get a reading on their altitude. And when the co-pilot addressed it to the pilot, he asked the pilot, do you want to return? Because they knew very early on that those readings were incorrect. And then the air traffic control proceeded to clear Lion Air to go up to 27,000 feet. Surely if there was an issue, right, whether the jet is old or new, if there were mis wrong readings with, uh, you know, the instruments in the cockpit, why isn't there standard operating procedure for these planes to return immediately to the ground? 
Yeah, there are so much difference between the 737 MAX and this 737-500. There are two different airplanes, two different technology. And what happened with the Lion Air is absolutely the problem from the instrument itself. And the pilot already aware that something happened with the airplanes and the Boeing already uh, showed that the AMCAS problems um, caused the catastrophic accident for Lion Air or even Ethiopian Air. And this airplane is completely different because nothing was happened until 10,900. And there's no such thing like a distress call because we can see there's no distress call in the squawk. And the, the, the air nav, the ATC will never say that the airplane on uh, the problem or any little situation. No, everything was normal uh, after passing 10,000 feet. Um, they do like normal procedures. They set the FMC to the constraint speed. Like b below 10,000 feet, they, they will fly at 250 knots. And after 10,000 feet, the, the, the autopilot, the flight management com computer, uh, automatically set the speed to the higher speed. Then they shallow their rate of climb, and suddenly uh, the dive down happen. So we, if you want to make like same comparison, this is completely different with the Lion Air situation, and we never know exactly what happened inside the communication. That's why we need to wait until the cockpit voice recorder happens, uh, comes, and we'll, we, we will wait until uh, the NTSC investigation. But if you are a member about the Silk Air, uh, the 1996, it's pretty much similar game, similar airplane, because it's one family, the 737-300 and 737-500, okay? That's a classic Boeing. Um, that was also the loss of aircraft control. So we may learn from previous accidents like loss of co aircraft control due at the same airplane types. That's what I mean. Mm. And Gamma, this is happening at an unusual time during the pandemic. Uh, what impact uh, do you think COVID-19 yeah. had in terms of the crash, given it's, you know, of course, the, the obvious effects in the aviation industry? And we hear the pilots forced to train on simulators. As some say they're rusty. Can you clarify that for us? Okay, every airline pilot, okay, uh, we are following the 121 regulation. And every six months, the pilot in command and also uh, the companies, they will conduct the proficiency check. That's for the captain. And then for the first officer, also got the same training, same examination. So I don't think the COVID-19 will affect everything uh, for the fi uh, pilot training part. Because if you are as a Boeing pilot, there is no way for you to get a training in the real airplane. Everything will be done in the level D flight simulator. We call that the full flight simulator level D that approved by any regulator like FAA, EASA, uh, ICAO. Okay, so every six months they will uh, jump into the simulator and for a pilot in command, they will also get a line check on the real airplane. So both pilots, I believe they are already qualified and they are proficient to conduct the flight. All right, uh, Gemma, thank you so much for talking to us today. That was Captain Gemma Goyardi, FAA flight instructor and citation VJ captain.